Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. This is Jerry DiMaggio. Welcome to another session of ARA Webinar Wednesdays. Today's program is Pavement Dynamics. How important is Pavement Dynamics under different dynamic loads? Next slide, please. I'd like to first go over a few housekeeping items with you. First of all, if you're experiencing an issue with your sound and you're using your computer speakers, please disconnect your speakers and then dial in using your phone. If you continue to have an issue, please use the chat button as highlighted on this slide and send the message, but send that message only to the host. Next slide, please. Throughout the entire program today, we encourage you to ask questions. You can see highlighted on slide number three, the Q and A uh, icon. Those questions will be addressed at the conclusion of today's technical program. When you direct your questions, please send them to the host and the panelist. And I wanna reinforce that we sometimes have difficulty. I'll be returning at the conclusion of today's technical program to facilitate the Q and A. So again, questions throughout the program, send them to both the host and the panelists. Next slide, please. Last housekeeping slide, to view the presentation in full screen mode, as you see highlighted on slide four, at the top of your webinar settings, click on the down arrow, I like view, and then choose to fit the viewer. Just as a reminder, in all of our programs, that we previously offered as well as this program in order to receive the one hour EDH certificate, you must attend a full one hour webinar. More information on that issue will be provided at the conclusion of today's presentation. Next slide, please. Now it's my honor to introduce our presenter, Dr. Young Lee. Young is a senior research engineer with the Research and Technology Deployment Group of ARA. He's a civil engineer with a PhD degree in pavements and materials engineering from Michigan State University. Young joined ARA initially in 2006 as a staff engineer and worked as a full-time consultant for the Florida Department of Transportation, where he managed ARA's non-destructive testing activities for FDOT. In 2010, he joined FDOT as the state's non-destructive testing engineer prior to rejoining ARA in 2015. Dr. Lee has over 16 years of experience in the field of pavement evaluation, structural analysis, forensic investigations using non-destructive testing devices, such as a folding weight deflectometer, round penetrating radar, locked wheel friction testers, and various texture meters. In addition, Young has conducted various research studies on truck pavement interaction, dynamic modeling of asphalt pavements, pavement surface characteristics, as well as viscoelastic asphalt material characterization. Now it's my great pleasure to introduce my colleague and friend, Dr. Lee. Thank you, Jerry. Good morning, good afternoon, everyone, depending on where you are. Um, I'll start off with uh, the, a few learning objectives for uh, today's presentation. So the first learning objective is to understand the basic models that are available for payment response modeling or simulation. And the next objective is to be able to distinguish the different types of dynamic responses and more specifically the transient response versus the steady state response. And finally, uh, be able to understand when the uh, dynamics of pavement or payment dynamics is important uh, versus when it may not be as important. So go, basically going back to the question that was raised on the top of slide of this presentation. Here is the outline of my presentation. I'll start with a, uh, a very brief introduction and I'll go over some of the definitions and clarification of some of the terms that are used frequently. Then I'll show you uh, the payment models, uh, the structure and the loading characteristics for uh, use for the simulation. And I'll introduce a couple different analysis methods, uh, namely the fixed point analysis versus moving frame analysis method. And then I'll talk about two different payment responses, again, transient versus steady state 
and I'll show you an analysis example and wrap the presentation up with a brief summary. Okay, so there are, um, so our vehicles and our tires interact with uh, the pavement in many different ways. And one of the reasons for the vehicle pavement interaction is simply because our pavements are not perfectly flat. And, and, that, and the smoothness or the roughness of the pavement causes our vehicles to move up and down. And the vehicle movement, the up, up and down vehicle movement also affects the response of the pavement beneath the vehicles. So for studying this type of vehicle pavement interaction, past researchers have used many, many different uh, vehicle models uh, for, the, uh, for uh, vehicle dynamics, and also uh, many, many different pavement models were used uh, for, 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 for studying the uh, response of the pavement. But for this presentation, we will only focus on the viscoelastic versus the dynamic pavement models. But what do I mean when I say dynamic? Just to give you an example, this animation here um, is the animation I had included in uh, one of my past Webinar Wednesday presentation uh, two years ago. And for me to describe this, uh, this model was developed using a dynamic pavement model under a dynamic load. And as for the materials, I used the dynamic modulus for the asphalt concrete material, which I obtained from uh, a previous dynamic back calculation that I had conducted. And I don't know how many times I used the word dynamic, but I didn't necessarily mean the same thing um, every time I used the word dynamic. So um, we will clarify uh, some of these terminologies as we proceed uh, with the presentation. Okay, so definitions, we'll start with the load. <clears throat> And uh, as for loading, uh, there's two types of loading, static versus dynamic. Static load is basically a load that was there. It is still there, and it will be there forever without any changes. Okay, so dynamic load essentially is the load that is not static. Something is changing in the dynamic load, and it's not limited to the magnitude itself. I mean, it can change its magnitude, it can change its position, or it can change the direction that the load is acting at. And if there's any of those changes in, in load, um, it is a dynamic load. So again, dynamic load is the load that can change its magnitude, location, or direction. And what is a dynamic pavement model? Um, again, there are many, many different uh, pavement models that have been used in the past, and I'm not going to show you an exhaustive list, but some of the representative models would be the elastic model that is not really time dependent. The viscoelastic model uh, <clears throat> becomes time dependent, and it may show a creep type of creep or relaxation type of response uh, under a uh, step loading. Now, when you go to a dynamic model, all of a sudden you start seeing some vibration, um, even under, even when the load is not uh, uh, vibratory. Okay, and in a continuum like pavements, these vibration vibrations translate to what we call uh, the wave propagation. So the pavement dynamics or dynamic pavement model is the model that is capable of simulating the effect of inertia or mass and hence the vibration or wave propagation. Just to show you how the viscoelastic response may differ uh, from the dynamic response, consider a cosine um, loading that starts at time zero and goes forever. And in the long term, both the viscoelastic and the dynamic model will approach uh, the same shape as the, as the load. And we call that type of response a steady state response that occurs in the long term. But at the very short term, the dynamic model will show you some very high frequency uh, vibration that looks almost random. And that type of response is called a uh, transient response. That is a characteristic of a dynamic system. 
So again, dynamic payment model or payment dynamic um, um, is to mean that, that the model uh, is capable of simulating the transient vibration and or wave propagation within the pavement structure. What is dynamic modulus? Well, <clears throat> the viscoelastic, the modulus of a viscoelastic material, and in our case, um, of the asphalt concrete, the modulus of asphalt concrete is either dependent on time or frequency. And these materials can be tested either in the frequency domain or in the time domain. Now, I'm not going to go into any details, but one parameter that you can obtain from the frequency domain testing is called complex modulus. And dynamic modulus is a term or is a parameter that is derived from the complex modulus. So what does this mean? This means that dynamic modulus is a property of viscoelastic material, and it is not necessarily the property of a dynamic system. But if it's not a property of a dynamic system, why do we even call it a call it the um, dynamic modulus. And Dr. Richard Kim at North Carolina State University, he's an authority in the theory of viscoelasticity as well as asphalt material characteristics and behavior. And in, in his textbook, he provides this one paragraph that um, uh, clarifies the, uh, uh, the reason. And I'm not gonna read the whole paragraph, but uh, basically he says he is using the word dynamic because it was tried traditionally and conventionally uh, used in the literature. It was just a convention. Uh, it was called dynamic modulus uh, for, for a very long time. But again, dynamic modulus is a property of viscoelastic materials, not necessarily the property of a dynamic system. So let's, uh, let me show you some of the uh, a couple of the payment models, and I mentioned that we will be focusing on the dynamic and viscoelastic models. So for the dynamic model, what I've used is called ViscoWave. Um, it's, uh, uh, it's a program that, uh, that I developed as part of my uh, PhD work. Um, it's, uh, it's a dynamic, axisymmetric, uh, finite layer solution that is based on impulse loading and responses. And it was originally developed uh, for um, the analysis SWD, falling weight deflectometer uh, type of impact loading, but it was upgraded uh, to simulate the payment response under moving loads. And as for the viscoelastic model, I've used Dr. Shapery's uh, quasi-elastic theory, uh, which allows us to efficiently and accurately approximate the response of a viscoelastic material using an elastic model, okay? So the elastic model, the elastic pavement model that I used to approximate the viscoelastic response is called Kenlayer. That was developed at the University of Kentucky, uh, but, uh, but was implemented uh, by myself uh, um, um, independently. And as for the pavement, I'm going to use a conventional three-layer flexible pavement that has 12 inches of asphalt with frequency-dependent dynamic modulus over 12 inches of base over a fairly weak subgrade. And as for the loading, I'm always going to be using uh, a full axle um, that has nine kips on each side uh, of the axle over uh, dual tires traveling at 60 miles an hour. And this is always the load I'm gonna be using unless otherwise stated in the presentation. Let's look at two different analysis methodologies. The first being the fixed point analysis. In the fixed, in the fixed point analysis, uh, the load is moving, but the payment response is calculated at a fixed point in the pavement. So even if the load is moving from here to here, the pavement response is always calculated at this fixed point. And it's 
it's similar to um, a, an instrumentation that is embedded in the pavement. Uh, no matter where the load is and no matter how fast or slow the load is moving, the payment response is always um, obtained for this fixed location. And on the other hand, we have the, what is called the moving frame analysis. And in the moving frame analysis, the load is moving and the response is calculated, calculated at points that move with the load. And it's, uh, if it's not clear to some of you, um, uh, imagine you have some type of a traffic speed deflection device. Um, so for example, uh, this truck here is the rolling uh, wheel uh, deflectometer that, that ARA had. And basically the payment is loaded with this trailer axle here at the back. And the deflections are measured using the sensors that are uh, mounted on the, on the truck bed. So all these sensors, all these measurement, measuring sensors are traveling with the load at the same speed, okay? And we can simulate something similar in, in the, um, uh, using the theoretical um, um, models, but it just hasn't been done frequently uh, because the mathematics become a little more complicated. But it's doable. So let's talk about um, two different payment responses against transient versus steady state response as, as they happen in pavement. So for the, I, I'm gonna give you, show you a first example using the fixed point analysis. And as for the dynamic model, whenever I start the simulation, I actually have to have the load land on the pavement. Uh, before it can start moving. So for this particular example, I'm gonna have the wheel land 50 feet away from the fixed observation point, uh, but after it makes its landing, it's going to travel at a constant magnitude. And the magnitude is constant, but the load is still dynamic because it's changing its position, <clears throat> okay? Now, how does the payment response uh, um, look like uh, at this fixed observation point. Well, obviously, if the load approaches the, the fixed point, the deflection or the payment response will increase. And as the load moves away, the, the response will die away. Uh, but where is the transient response? What is this little bump? That's the transient response that occurred when the wheel um, initially made the landing onto the pavement. But it's, it was 50 feet away from the point that we are interested in. And its magnitude is fairly negligible. So we almost always um, ignore the, the transient response that happened down here and only focus on the deflection that, uh, or, or the response that we are interested in. After all, that is why we had the instrumentation embedded at that particular location. Now, if we consider the same type of load, again, that makes the landing here and then starts moving at a constant magnitude, but look at the response using the moving frame analysis. So the, the observation point is now directly under the uh, moving axle. And the transient response, of course, it's much bigger uh, because it happened right below the axle. Uh, but then it dies out pretty quickly, and then it uh, basically approaches a flat line, uh, uh, which is similar to the load. And just for comparison purposes, I've also showed, I'm also showing the response from a viscoelastic system. Um, it also approaches a flat line, uh, just because the load is constant. Uh, but it does show a little bit of creep, creep response at the very beginning. But then this transient response, uh, that occurs at the, uh, right after the landing of the of the load. Um, it may look significant, but um, time, when you convert this distance uh, to time using a vehicle speed of 60 miles an hour, all this transient response happened within a tenth of a second. Well, on top of so it, it happened very quickly and it disappeared very quickly. And on top of that, our, our vehicles, highway vehicles, do not really land on the pavement. So why do we care about 
this type of transient response. If you are familiar with a uh, what is called the falling weight deflectometer, it is a non-destructive testing equipment uh, that is one of the most frequently used non-destructive testing equipment for structural uh, capacity evaluation of pavements. But the way this device works is that it drops a mask onto the pavement. And it drops the mass fairly quickly. Um, the, the duration of the load is typically much less than a tenth of a second. So is this similar to vehicle landing, quote unquote, probably? And it does cause um, quite a bit of transient response and wave propagation within the pavement system. So <clears throat> When it comes to back calculation, back calculation means we are trying to um, evaluate the payment properties or parameters from the falling weight deflectometer data. And there's different types of back calculation that have been conducted in the past. And the most representative one is the static. Um, static back calculation do not depend on time. So um, um, only the peak load and the peak deflections are used. And viscoelastic and dynamic back calculation do involve uh, the load and deflection time history. But the viscoelastic back calculation can only account for the viscoelastic effect of asphalt materials. But dynamic back calculation involves um, the transient response that occurred due to the impact that was impact load uh, induced by the falling uh, falling mass. So again, dynamic back calculation involves uh, the FWD time history. The entire time history or portions of the time history um, is used for back calculation while accounting for the effect of inertia, i.e. the weight propagation effect. Just to give you a, look, uh, a feel for what the uh, 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 what the deflection, deflection time histories may look like um, using the dynamic versus viscoelastic model. Um, shown here on the left-hand side is a def uh, load and deflection time history that was measured uh, by an actual falling weight deflectometer. And the one in the middle is basically the deflection time histories that were simulated um, using a dynamic model. Uh, namely the visco wave. And you can see that the, uh, due to the wave uh, propagating outwards, the peak deflection at each sensor occur at different times. And there could be some free vibration even after the load has uh, died out. But you basically won't see that in the viscoelastic simulation. Um, you do have some time dependent response, but then all the peak responses will occur at the same time, uh, regardless of the location of your sensor, because the wave is not propagating in, in, in this model, and you simply will not see any vibration after the uh, load has died out. But it's just going to be a delayed recovery, which is another characteristic of this elastic material. So payment response under FWD, falling weight deflectometer type of loading, occurs within a very short amount of time and, it, and, and the payment response is transient. And if you, any of you um, out there um, is interested in using ViscoWave uh, for the dynamic analysis of falling weight deflectometer data, uh, ViscoWave is now uh, available as an open source um, program uh, for, for, for anyone to download and use. And I've put a, a link um, uh, on this uh, kind of, uh, on this slide. So please um, go ahead and use it. And if you um, have any questions, um, just just let me know. I'll uh, try to help you as much as as much as I can. Now coming back to this slide, uh, we talked about the transient response that occurs right after the landing of the load. But once the transient response dies out, it's 
basically approaches a steady state response. And in this case, the steady state response was simply a constant because the load magnitude was constant. And that is the reason that this animation that I showed you earlier didn't really look like the load was moving or the pavement was deflecting in, a, in any different way because the response was constant everywhere. So the interesting thing now is what if the load um, in the steady state response portion, long-term uh, response was not constant. And that leads us to an example that I want to show you. So we're, we're going to be seeing some non-constant magnitude uh, dynamic load and uh, there's many different ways I can simulate dynamic loads, um, but one of the representative uh, ways, one of the most frequent, frequently used ways is through the, uh, through the vehicle dynamics, which is a study of the vehicle motion. And there are many, many vehicle motions that have been used uh, for, for that purpose. <clears throat> but we will um, um, stick to some of the simple vehicle models and the first vehicle model I'm going to use is a three-dimensional uh, truck, truck and trailer model. So here's a rear view of the uh, trailer, and here's a side view of the truck-trailer um, system. This entire um, system has 14 degrees of freedom, uh, but it's still, and it may look complicated, but it's still a relatively simple vehicle model because we are not including any of the nonlinear suspension characteristics. In other words, if you look at this diagram more carefully, it's just a bunch of masses connected using different springs and dash pots um, that are, that are uh, linear um, in nature. And as for the moving observation points, I wanted to see a bigger picture. So uh, placed, I'm going to start with a total of 2,400 moving observation points or 1,200 moving observation points within each real path based at every 0.1 uh, foot. And that should be sufficient to give us the full picture in each of the real paths. Let's look at how the deflections may uh, may change depending on the vehicle motion. So here's a payment profile that I borrowed from one of the LTPP long-term payment performance um, sites. That dash line shows you the location of the steering axle, the, the trailer axle, rear view of the trailer motion, and the uh, motion of two um, half trucks from the side. This is how the dynamic load changes in each of these axles. And that's basically the payment deflection under the entire entire truck. And these are just uh, zoomed in versions um, of the deflection for the respective uh, tires or axles. And you can see the deflections are bouncing up and down as the truck is bouncing up and down. But is it really possible to see uh, the wave propagation uh, and my answer is no. Uh, the deflections are bouncing up and down primarily because of the uh, truck bouncing up and down. We don't really see any stress wave or deflection wave that is uh, propagating from, uh, from the load. So I wanted to um, show you another example, and this time we're only going to focus on this trailer um, axle, one of these trailer axles. And instead of putting the moving frame analysis only along the center of this tire, I'm going to put a total of 90,000 moving observation points, both in the direction of traffic as well as in the transverse direction so that we can um, see the wave propagating out from, from this tire. And so this animation uh, basically shows you a 3D visualization of the payment deflection. Um, and you can, so this tire moving up and down represents the dynamic load. And this is just a, a, 
trace of the dynamic load with this little red dot showing you the location of the load. This is the same model as the one on the left, but without the tire, so you can better see uh, the deflection. And this is just the payment deflection along the center line of the tire. And if you look very closely, when the load makes a sudden quote unquote landing or the load increase, um, um, uh, all of a sudden you can see the red area propagating out from the pavement. And that is the wave propagation. It is the stress wave propagating outwards from the load. Now, do we see that type of wave propagation in the viscoelastic model? And of course the answer is no. So um, the, here the animation that is on the left-hand side is the same anim animation as in the previous slide. So it's a dynamic model and you can see the wave propagation, the red area propagating out. The one, the, mo the 3D model on the right-hand side is from the viscoelastic model. So there is some um, um, ups and downs depending on on the load, but there really is no wave propagating out from from the load. And the 2D graph uh, that's behind this 3D model basically shows you a comparison of the payment deflection along the center line um, for both uh, the viscoelastic and the dynamic model. So looking at the uh, load and the deflection uh, time histories from both the uh, dynamic and viscoelastic payment models, um, they are different. I mean, the responses um, are different even under the same load. And one of the reasons is because those are different models. Um, so they may have different uh, magnitudes and they also have different phase. Uh, but this difference in phase was really, really small. Um, it was only uh, 0.88 feet uh, for this particular example. And when translated into time using the vehicle speed of 60 miles an hour, it was, al was almost less than 100th of a second. So are these differences significant? Well. If you ask me, it depends on um, how you would want to use these uh, models for, uh, for simulation. And one um, application of the moving frame analysis I'm interested in is uh, what's called the Mechanistic Empirical um, International Roughness Index, IRI prediction. And the methodology basically takes the initial pavement profile and it runs through the vehicle simulation to get the dynamic load that varies with, uh, uh, with location. And from this dynamic load, we use the moving frame analysis uh, for the pavement to calculate the spatially varying response and then the spatially varying rep depth. And we use this rut depth, permanent uh, deformation, to update our payment profile and basically repeat this process until we obtain the performance um, curve that we want. I'm going to show you an example um, of the ME mechanistic empirical IRI prediction using um, this initial payment profile. So this initial payment profile was perfectly flat uh, except for this half sign bump that had a height of three quarters of an inch. And for the vehicle model, I wanted to keep it simple. So I started with the most simple uh, truck model that is out there. Um, uh, more specifically, it was a quarter truck model that was developed by Dr. David Vaughn. And as for updating the payment profile, I needed to calculate the permanent deformation or the rut uh, within the pavement. And I've, I've borrowed two different uh, rut models, one for the asphalt concrete material. Uh, this rut model comes from Ash to Wear Pavement ME. And um, 
I've used the default uh, coefficients or the global coefficient for all these parameters. And as for the um, uh, temperature of the asphalt, I had fixed it um, to 70 degrees Fahrenheit. So there was no temperature variation um, in, the, in the pavement. And for the separate rotting model, I uh, borrowed one simple model uh, that was developed by Asphalt Institute uh, quite a few decades ago. And uh, using this, I'm going to simulate the uh, IRI or the uh, payment performance up to 20 million vehicle passes uh, with the payment profile updated at every 50,000 vehicle passes. But before I show you how the uh, payment profile is updated, here's a quick comparison of the vertical strains within the asphalt layer and on top of the subgrade from both the dynamic and the viscoelastic models. And you can see the, I mean, there are differences, again, in, in magnitude, just because these, these two models are different. Uh, they are different models, but uh, they are showing very similar trends, right? Because of the, uh, they are basically behaving in a similar trend, just depends on how the vehicle um, um, responded to the payment profile. And this is basically how the uh, payment profile gets updated as, uh, uh, as the rut progresses in the pavement. And the one on the left uh, is the payment profile or the rut depth uh, obtained using the dynamic payment model. And the one on the right is the payment profiles um, updated and obtained from a viscoelastic model. And you can see, yes, the, again, the rut magnitudes are different slightly because there are, the responses were different, but we're using the same coefficients for um, the, the rut depth models. But overall, the trend, if you look at the trend or the shape of the rutted pavement surface profile, they're very similar. So it essentially boils down to, again, the vehicle response. So after 20 million passes, um, the dynamic model showed a little bit higher of a rut depth on average. And that's just because, again, the, uh, these are two different models uh, that gives you two different magnitude of the response. But if you can look at the IRI uh, from both the uh, dynamic and the viscoelastic models, they do follow some similar um, trend um, over uh, the 20 million um, vehicle passes. Uh, of course, they both started at an IRI of 31.1 inch per mile at the very beginning of the simulation. And the dynamic model um, showed slightly higher IRI trend um, towards the end, but these differences could be uh, refined um, if we have better uh, coefficients or calibrated coefficients for the empirical uh, portion of the model. So here are some preliminary observations uh, when we do not consider the transient vibration or the transient landing effect the dynamic and the viscoelastic models seem to produce similar results under dynamic loading. And it's probably because the uh, vehicle motion is dominating. Um, it's, it's more important. Um, and another reason could be that the stress wave uh, within the pavement, the stress wave that occurs within the pavement is much, much faster than uh, our vehicle uh, uh, bouncing up and down or the vehicle speed itself. So it just disappears very, very rapidly. And if we can get similar results from both models, the viscoelastic model has the potential to be much more efficient than the dynamic model because you really don't have to worry about uh, the wave propagation effects, which uh, tend to make things more and more complicated. And this is just some uh, food for thought for uh, future researchers that are out there 
Um, and I just demonstrated an example of the mechanistic empirical IRI, but IRI has been used to predict other important uh, parameters um, uh, of the pavement, pa pavements. Uh, for example, the greenhouse gas emission uh, or fuel consumption, tire wear, or the vehicle maintenance cost, uh, and other user costs that had empirical relations to IRI could possibly be predicted in a mechanistic empirical uh, manner. So just to provide you with a brief summary, again, dynamic load can change its magnitude or it can change its location or the direction of, of the load that it's acting. And the dynamic payment model um, accounts for, is the model that can account for transient vibration and the wave propagation, stress wave propagation within the pavement. And dynamic modulus, again, dynamic modulus is not a property of a dynamic system. It is a property of a viscoelastic material. And dynamic back calculation is a back calculation that involves the FWD deflection, uh, load and deflection time histories using a pavement model that can account for the effect of transient wave propagation. And to uh, summarize what we learned today, dynamic response, there are two primary types of dynamic responses, namely the transient response that occurs at the beginning of the disturbance that uh, disappears rather quickly, and the steady state response uh, that occurs uh, in the long term. And for the payment models, the payment dynamics or dynamic payment models may be important for transient type of responses. For example, uh, the response under a falling weight deflectometer type of impact load, or if you're actually interested in an aircraft landing, um, you may have to um, use a dynamic payment model. But if you're not interested in such transient responses, uh, you might be able to use a viscoelastic payment model and produce similar results, but in a more efficient, efficient manner. And I'm going to say that these statements um, are not conclusions, uh, they are uh, they are observations because I am making these statements based on uh, one payment profile, that a payment structure that I have showed you under, under a single vehicle speed of 60 miles an hour. And things may or may not change under different conditions, but um, just wanted to point out that transient response versus steady state responses are different. And depending on what response you're interested in, you may want to choose the model that you want to use um, in a more efficient manner. I just wanted to take a minute to um, remember Dr. Huang, uh, who was a professor at University of Kentucky. He was an author of the Payment, and, uh, Payment Analysis and Design textbook that many of us payment engineers have seen or read. Uh, but he was also the developer of the Ken Layer uh, program that I have implemented independently. And all the mathematics that I needed to implement that uh, program was in, the, in, in his textbook, but he um, passed away, unfortunately, last year. So I just wanted to <clears throat> take a moment to, to remember him. And that's all I had uh, for today's webinar. And I'm going to bounce it back to Jerry. Back to you, Jerry. Okay, thank you, Jan. Um, if you haven't already submitted your questions, remember to submit them to both the host and the participants. We do have a number of questions uh, that we'll get to momentarily. Um, and I'd like to first speak a little bit about what's up and coming relative to uh, Webinar Wednesdays. Remember, webinar Wednesdays are always on a Wednesday, and generally we schedule based on availability and holidays to um, present the webinars on either the third or the fourth week of the month. On July 20th, 
mechanistic analysis of asphalt rutting and airfield pavements using physical plastic drift model. The speaker will be Ghassan Chapa, uh, who is a principal civil engineer at ARA. I'd like to remind everybody, all of our presenters are ARA uh, professionals, including myself. On August 31st, we have geostatistical methods for estimating values of interest at unsampled locations. That's a, a generic topic, even though it might be applicable in the examples, the pavements. The speaker will be Brandon Artist. He's a senior civil engineer with ARA as well. You see on slide 58, the location as a reminder where you can register for our webinars, and we encourage you to do so. We typically have three to 500 sites that are registered, and then individually, people, uh, the sites that actually join based on conflicts, somewhere in a couple of hundred, typically two or 300. Next slide, please. And I'd like to get to the Q&A program uh, for today. And we do have a number of questions. So Young, the, the first question, I'll paraphrase as we go along here, is by Amira. And your presentation was mostly limited to flexible pavements. Can this mechanistic empirical IRI prediction methodology also be used on rigid pavements? Uh, thank you, Jerry. The answer to that question is um, yes and no. Um, no in the sense that the rigid pavements do not rut like flexible pavements. So it's probably going to require a different model for, uh, for the iteration. And the, the parameters that affect the uh, IRI of rigid pavements are somewhat different from those of flexible pavements. For example, curling um, uh, and faulting of rigid pavement slabs and joints those are two of uh, two parameters that significantly affect the IRI of rigid pavement. Even without any damage in the pavement, the, the, the effect of curling on IRI could be relatively significant. Um, so um, if we can find a model, if we can incorporate a model uh, that takes uh, uh, into account the effect of curling as well as faulting, and the effect of other payment distresses on rigid payment IRI, then uh, possibly uh, we could uh, do a mechanistic empirical IRI prediction for uh, rigid payment as well. But it's going to require some different um, um, transfer functions or empirical portions that uh, uh, predict the performance. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question is from Karen. And Karen's question is, uh, can you run or conduct, I guess, a moving frame analysis with layered elastic models? Yes, absolutely. I mean, it's, I mean, with the layered elastic model, I mean, the model itself does not depend on, on time. So no matter, um, let me go back to one of the, so if you had, let's say, this type of loading, sinusoidal uh, loading, with the layered elastic model, you just uh, uh, predict uh, the response for any given magnitude. You don't really have to worry about time. So the answer is yes. It's just a matter of um, calculating the response at different moving uh, observation points it's going to be much, much more efficient and easier just because you don't have to worry about the time dependency coming from the materials or or the wave propagation that is present in, in dynamic models. Okay, uh, and we still have a bit of time for questions. I want to remind everybody, when you submit a question, send it to both the host and the panelists. Please don't send it to everyone. So the third question is from Steve. Is the open source Visco wave only for FWD type impact loading or is it also capable of simulating moving loads? It is only for FWD type of impact load. Um, and, and I'm gonna say for now, um, that is because of uh, vehicle simulation using Visco wave takes 
much, much more time um, than it is needed for the SWD type of loading. And uh, personally, I, what I wanted to do was, because the viscoelastic model seems to be doing so well uh, for uh, moving loads, and when we basically throw away the transient portion of the response, um, I might be able to release a improved version of the viscoelastic handler as an open source um, when, when the time comes. So that, that, that was my plan. Okay, thank you. And we, we do have a number of questions. I'd like to remind everybody, you can see on slide 59, Young has been gracious enough to include his email address. Should we run out of time relative and be relative to the available time and unable to address your question? We'll follow up with, uh, please follow up with Young uh, via his email address. Uh, that would be the best way that we can do that. We'll get as many questions as we can. Next question is from Andrew. And the question is, have you checked the equivalency of these models at different temperatures and is there more of a difference at low temperature, high temperature, or relatively similar results at all temperatures? Uh, honestly, I have not looked at um, uh, different temperatures. And yes, that is one thing we should be, um, we should not forget because the viscoelastic material is dependent on temperature. Uh, but like I said, for, for all this exercise, the temperature of the asphalt was fixed to 70 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay, next question is from Akash. And did you use a uniform mesh when calculating deflections or use a smaller size cells near the tire and increase the size of the cells as you moved away? Um, I think uh, the question is more about uh, what we call a finite element uh, type of uh, analysis, but uh, the visco wave is not finite element, it's finite layer. So one layer becomes an entire element. So there is no such thing as fine or coarse mesh uh, closer to the tire. Uh, the, the, the solution within um, a single layer is solved semi-analytically and the layers or the elements are connected in a way similar to the finite elements. So, um, and that's also the, uh, that also applies for a Ken layer, it's layered elastic. So there is no fine or coarse mesh uh, near the load. We can calculate the response at any point we want. Okay, thank you. Next question is from a young engineer named Kurt. And Young, how do you envision dynamic load analysis being implemented within pavement ME design? And is it incorporated into the computational requirements? Is it incorporated into the mechanistic analysis or into the empirical models? Uh, that's one of the tough questions, um, but uh, the pavement ME, although it has pavement ME, there, the, the, the IRI model in payment ME is purely empirical uh, because it's just a regression um, equation that depends on the initial IRI um, as well as other um, distresses such as cracking or rutting. But it's, it's, it's not mechanistic empirical because it does not go back to the payment profile. The, the IRI calculation is 100% mechanistic. You put a um, gold, golden car model um, over a profile and you calculate the IRI. So if you kill that portion of the analysis, it becomes empirical. And it's my vision, although it may or may not happen, is that um, a mechanistic empirical IRI prediction may be more realistic. Um, and that's one of the things I had talked about in one of the previous webinar um, presentation two years ago. Um, and, and But the downside of mechanistic empirical IRI prediction is that uh, it will take a lot more time. Um, okay. Things. Okay, we've got about three minutes uh, left and we have three questions. The next question is from John. 
How do you use these models to predict rotting? Do the truck stoppage at lights or turning and stopping at the same time? No, turning and stopping is not uh, considered in the model I showed you today. Um, because when you want to articulate the effect of turning, stopping, or accelerating, you need to bring in the horizontal load at the pavement surface. And the model I have right now, they are not capable of stimulating the horizontal load. Okay, thank you. The next question is from Ali. And Ali's question is, is the developed model capable of considering the traffic load speed? Uh, could you repeat the question, Jerry? Yeah, so it's from Ali, and his question is, is the developed model capable of considering the traffic load speed? Traffic load speed? I, yeah, I, I think the speed of the traffic is really the question. Um, yes, um, uh, the moving load that I simulated here in was at 60 miles an hour, but we can change that to any speed we want. Uh, the only thing that may need a little more work is when you don't have a constant speed. So for example, your uh, vehicle is going from zero to 60 miles an hour in so many seconds. Um, that may need a little more work, but that, um, but as of right now, it's only a constant speed, but it, that constant speed can be whatever speed uh, we want. Okay, thank you. We have one last question in about one minute left, so let's see if we can get it in. So the question is, can you please elaborate on MEIRI? IRI is not a point measurement. How can the profile be up, uploaded using the predicted running? I'll repeat that. Can you please elaborate on MIRI? IRI is not a point measurement. How can the profile be uploaded using the predicted running? Yeah, so when you put this entire payment profile under the vehicle, um, I mean, if you if you had put like a quarter, quarter car or what we call the golden car, it, the golden car uh, response reduces all these numbers into a single number that we call IRI. And basically, that's what we're trying to do. But for updating the payment profile, we're trying to use different pay, uh, different vehicles or something that is more representative of, of the trucks that are out there. And we're calculating the rust depth that varies with location. And if you had, uh, uh, let's say, four inch rut here versus one inch rut here, I mean, it's not going to be constant, right? So that's how the profiles were updated. It's basically the spatially varying uh, rut depth. And I don't think I have more time to uh, go into this. Detail. No, un unfortunately, we're I'll, I'll follow up. Yeah, uh, and uh, again, we're unfortunately out of time for questions, but you have Young's email address and uh, okay, leave that up there for a second. Please go to the next slide, we've got two more slides. So on behalf of ARA, I wanna thank everybody for joining as always. Uh, hopefully you've gotten uh, some positive learning outcomes as Young presented them from today's presentation. Today's presentation as all of our ARA Wednesdays is being recorded. There'll be a link that will be made available on the ARA webinar Wednesday website and that'll be should be available early next week but perhaps through the holiday it might take a little bit longer we'll also be sending a pdf certificate to all the participants who are verified by your attendance report or our attendance report as being present in the webinar for the entire hour finally a copy of today's presentation will also be included with that certificate please allow a few weeks to receive your certificate last slide please uh, ARA is a wonderful company. We're about 1,600 strong across the entire United States, as well as offices in Canada. We're always looking for great people to join our team. If you're interested in employment opportunities with ARA's transportation and infrastructure offices, that's one of our five business sectors as I count them, then please send a brief resume to the and your contact information to the address that you see on this slide.
I want to thank you once again for joining today's program. Remember July 20th, we'll have another exciting webinar Wednesday for you. I want to wish everybody a happy 4th of July weekend. Uh, be careful, be safe, and may God bless you all.